have an agenda, you need to recognize it. Listening to all the information and putting it together, so you structure a transaction up front that is a win-win deal, but not just a win-win deal, but a deal that meets and completes all of the underlying issues that are the reason the person is selling the place in the, in the building in the first place. Why would you sell a building with that kind of awesome cash flow? Welcome to CREPN Radio for influential commercial real estate professionals who work with investors, buyers, and sellers of commercial real estate coast to coast. Whether you're an investor, broker, lender, property manager, attorney, or accountant, we're here to learn from the experts. Welcome to Commercial Real Estate Pro Network, CREPN Radio. This is episode number 82. Our podcast is about commercial real estate, where weekly we share conversations with commercial real estate investors and professionals who provide insight and knowledge to help our listeners grow their real estate portfolio. Whether you're a veteran investor or you've been thinking about investing, we're glad you're here. My name is J. Darren Gross. In just a minute, we're going to speak with Doc Howard Dr. Howard Holler. In just a minute, we're going to speak with our guest, Dr. Howard Holler. Doc is a 40-year real estate veteran. He's a developer, investor, mentor, and regular speaker at conventions for contractors and investors. Today, he shares a story about how one of his students was able to purchase a property they originally thought was out of reach. They did this because of information they learned during due diligence. It's a great story and a reminder of how important it is to pay attention to all the information you gather during due diligence. Also, Doc provides a special offer for our listeners to take advantage of at the end of the um, at the end of the conversation. So be sure to listen through. We get to this and a whole lot more. Here now is my conversation with Doc Holler. On the line today, we're fortunate to have my guest. His name is uh, Dr. Howard Holler. Uh, Friendly, or I think his uh, friends call him Doc, and uh, he's he allowed me to call him Doc. But uh, he is a uh, just a, an incredible gentleman. I met him on uh, LinkedIn here, oh, probably three or four months ago, and I've gotten to know him. He's a 40-year uh, commercial real estate professional. He's a, a coach and a mentor uh, to many. He's also uh, been a contractor. He's built over 3.8 million square feet of, of real estate. And he's an investor. He's a speaker at many builder and uh, commercial real estate events. My guest, uh, Doc Holler. Doc, are you there? I'm here. Hey, it's great to hear your voice. Good to talk to you, Daryl. Thanks. Yeah. Hey, before we uh, uh, get into our topic today, and, and uh, I think our, our listeners are going to be uh, uh, very entertained and, and their eyes will be opened uh, uh, as we get into the uh, due diligence and, um, you know, what all, some of the uncommon things before we get into that though, uh, could you, uh, do the listeners a favor and, and tell a little bit more about your, your background and that, that, uh, beef, inter- uh, not a beef, but a brief introduction I gave you there. I'd be happy to. I bought my first house at 22, fresh out of graduate school, and I was a corporate officer at the Bank of America. I made $63,000 in the early 70s in my first deal. That's a decent residential deal today, but back then it was a boatload of money, and it changed my life, and I decided to venture into commercial real estate. I've been investing in real commercial real estate now for literally 40 years. Um, office building, shopping centers, part of buildings, I have built office building, shopping centers, theaters, and uh, I've been blessed to be able to do this business for my career. Uh, Along the way, I picked up a general contractor's license in California. I've had that for over 30 years. I'm an engineering contractor in California for building high-rises and big projects. I'm also a licensed broker in California for over 30 years. Um, I picked up a Ph.D. from Gonzaga. uh, in leadership studies later on in life, but I'm here to talk about a transaction that, that I did with one of my mentees, but I coach, I mentor one-on-one, and now I'm about to launch a course online on how to do commercial real estate for those that would really like to understand how to do this. 
without the twenty, thirty thousand dollar one on one mentorship price for a fraction of the cost, I'm giving my forty plus years of experience to my online mentees. So that's where I'm coming from right now, Darren. Well, uh, sounds like you're more than qualified with your uh, your experience to uh, mentor people, and I'm sure that uh, uh, there are those in the audience would uh, like to take you up on that. Um, before we uh, we get in, I just want to kind of well, I guess this is kind of a, a good uh, a good segue here. So, topic today is due diligence, and uh, it, when I say due diligence, I think that myself and most uh, probably start with the physical characteristics of the property, uh, the condition, the uh, the roof, the uh, the rents. The uh, vacancies, the uh, you know, is there is there any bills that you can identify that are that are uh, out of round that maybe you can you know through a value add strategy improve upon? And uh, you and I were talking, and you had this this uh, experience with one of your mentees that uh, didn't touch any of that and was a a huge uh, kind of an ace ace. Uh, that you were, you were able to play later in the in the negotiation there, and uh, does that kind of set it up set us up right for? for that's, your, that's, uh, this is a great. Um, right. I had a mentee who owned multiple single family dwellings, renting them out by the room to college students, two beds to a room, and was uh, making a boatload of money. But he was time freedom was being sucked away by being an involuntary um, house dad for he and a house mom to his, for his wife for these 36 students. That's a lot of kids. They didn't have kids, but now they got 36. So what they wanted to do is they wanted to go to the next level, and they wanted to buy a commercial property. And a friend of mine who was one of my commercial mentees recommended me, and we hooked up and. Uh, I said, are you ready to go to the next level? He said, I am. He said, but you're the architect of this whole thing, so I'm going to follow your suit. He's a bright accountant with lots of degrees and credentials, and he's making a boatload of money in his J-O-B. But he wanted to go to the next level. So I called up a real estate agent who's an attorney who specializes in commercial property. I told him, frankly, his stuff online I, I said the word sucked because it wasn't that, good. that wasn't that good. I said, do you know of an off-market property or even a pocket listing? Because we need to get something that makes a boatload of money, has triple net leases, and uh, is something that would be a good project for him to own. He said, your timing is perfect, Doc. I just got an off-market listing a pocket listing, if you will, from a guy who owns a beautiful building in town. I said, tell me about it. Well, the bottom line is it's a nice, very nice multi-story office building, and it had great tenants. It was 97% occupied, and uh, prior to closing, that last 3% was leased up by the largest existing tenant with 60% occupancy. It was a beautiful building. The builder, broker, developer, contractor, uh, who's about my age and has my similar kind of credentials, took this thing and just did a fabulous job. Built it all out, fantastic TIs. But he had another project he was trying to do. In order to do that, he had to have this one off of his plate, even though it was making a lot of money. Now, for those in the audience, when I say triple net leases, I think you all know that means that the Tenants are paying property tax, insurance, maintenance, the utilities, everything. It's a pure stream of income. Can you imagine a stream of income coming off a building that the target price for the seller is $3 million? The triple net income documented because we went to these accountants and and my guy who's an accountant and a travel auditor verified it was $311,000 triple net income. And that's an awesome, more than 10% cap rate. Now, that in essence is a good deal, but 
We toured the building for four hours. And we weren't just looking at roofs and walls and so forth. We wanted to, I wanted to explore with the seller a dialogue to understand from him where he's coming from, what the experience had been, and he's happy to tell the story of how he took this gutted building, fixed it all up, and did the whole thing. I also learned that he had two buildings he bought originally. The first one was already fixed up. This one wasn't. And he put this building in a separate entity. It was in a, it was a corporation, actually. And I go, okay. And you have existing financing in place in that. He says, I do, I do. It's uh, just a hair under $2 million. I said, awesome. And so we continued the whole tour. We had lunch with them, and then I turned to my mentee, and I said, he wants cash to a new loan. He doesn't want to take any seller financing back. Simple question for you. Are you ready to plop down 60, you know, have a 60% LTV and plop down 40% for $1.2 million cash up front of closing plus closing costs. He said, I don't have that, Doc. So I said, you can't buy the building. And he and his wife were crushed. He said, all of this and we can't buy the building. I said, shh. I didn't say you wouldn't ultimately own it. I said, you're not going to buy the building. So we ordered the books over at his uh, the owner's account the following morning, and I just kind of, I let him do the audit. I just kind of reviewed all the tax returns and the note from the lender just to have that information available for me. And so we went over with a lawyer, and I basically asked them if they were prepared to do creative. Now, most people buy an asset purchase. They buy a building. Right. My suggestion was, oh, let's do something creative. I want you to write a letter of intent. He said, we can do that. I said, but I want the letter of intent to buy the entity that owns the office building. It's right. a little different twist, isn't it? Yeah, no, I, exactly the... Uh I always thought that people tried to separate themselves and not necessarily want to go for the entity, but rather uh, just the asset. Well, that, there's, a, there's a merit in that, but the objective was, according to the seller, the only asset ever in that entity was this building. And I put it upon the, the legal eagles, the lawyers, to verify that that was the fact. And they knew the, the, how the day of the corporation founding and so forth, and they verified that there were no other liabilities. There's your concern. You don't want other liabilities and other assets cluttering up this deal. It was a single asset entity. All right. With an existing loan in place. Well, so instead of paying $3 million for the building, $1.2 million cash down, to buy this wonderful three hundred eleven thousand dollar trip on that income, I went to the whiteboard. I did a red X on top of the proposed offer, request from the seller, and I drew up the following: two point five million dollars, yes, a five hundred thousand dollar discount. That my client, instead of putting up one point two million dollars, would put up a quarter of a million dollars plus twenty five thousand for closing costs. The seller would carry back. $250,000 second, and because the loan was in the name of the corporation, and reading the note, there was no due-on-sale clause for change of corporate ownership, I propose that he buy the entity. And de facto, de jure, whatever you want to call it, basically, he became the president of the corporation, his wife was the vice president of the corporation, and they owned an asset in that corporation, and they had an existing loan, which they still had. Wow. That's, I mean, can you, can you imagine the paradox of instead of $1.2 million, put up a quarter million dollars, and get on more than 100% cash on cash return? That's crazy. It doesn't happen. No, but it did happen. However, the bank did resist. 
They said, we're not going to do that. We're not going to allow you to do it. And so finally I got tired of them jerking everybody around, and I uh, called up the lawyers, and I said, gentlemen, ladies, I want you to write an Instagram. Please be advised. Having reviewed the note, which I sent to them, you have no legal point at which you can say he can't proceed forward to do this. So, unless you'd like to be held accountable and pay the legal fees for a lawsuit, which will result in the success of my client, we recommend that you acquiesce and proceed forward to close this transaction. Well, they didn't respond back to the attorneys. They called up the seller and said, you know what? <sighs> we'll never do this again. But they really are correct. They have the right to do what they want to do. However, the gentleman who owned it, his name was Jack. Jack, you've got a 10% carve-out personal guarantee. So you owe, you have a $200,000 personal liability that we're not going to release you from. So All he picked right. up the phone, not calling the lawyers or me or the real estate agent or anybody. He called the buyer directly, which is a little weird, but he did it. And he said, Adrian, I want to do this deal. I've got this other project. If I don't get this done timely, I can't proceed forward. I've got the deal lined up. I've extended that escrow, and I've got the, line rate, the, the, the loan ready to go, but I've got to get this deal closed. So here's what I need you to do. Since I have a $200,000 personal guarantee that I am stuck with, I'll close. However, I need from you a quarter of a million dollars additional collateral as security to make sure that I'm not exposed. Well, then Adrian called me up and said, I'm in the car, the car coming back from Idaho to Washington. And uh, he says, I'm going to do it. I said, no, you're not. Doc, I got to do it. I got to get it done. I said, no, you're in your office. I want a conference call. Set it up right now. Get everybody on the line. Your lawyer, his lawyer, Jack, you, your wife, if you like, and me. Let's talk. He said, what are you talking about? I said, I'll tell you when we get the conference call together. I said, do you have all the paperwork? So that's important. Do you have the tax return? All the due diligence that you did. Yes, we do. You have the tax return. Do you have the loan documents? Yes, you do. Cool. Well, that's wonderful. Call me back in two minutes, three minutes, when you get it set up. He did. Everybody's on the line. And he said, okay, Doc, you're in charge. So I addressed it primarily to Jack, the seller, because he, he related to me. And we're, you know, brokers, contractors, developers. And I said, Jack... You know what? If I were faced with the same dilemma you are, I'd ask Adrian for the quarter million dollars also. He said, and, and, and Adrian said, what? I said, shh. Jack, I understand your dilemma. And if I were in your shoes, I'd want collateral too. However, before we address that, because I have maybe a workaround for that, I have a question for you. Besides doing the TIs, which made you, you know, serious, serious six-figure money profits for the main tenant, did you also do the tenant improvements for the restaurant? Yes, I did. And I said, yeah, I know you did. He said, why do you say that? I said, Jack, were you paid in full for that? Or did you take something as a quid pro quo? And he had a gasp. He said, oh, yes, I do. I said, yes, you do. So I said, Adrian, do you have the tax returns handy? Pay six, last year's tax return. Top line, what does it say? It says $84,210. Go to the previous year's tax returns. It's on page five, last line. How much? 83802 I said, yep. I said, Jack, how much of the restaurant did you get in the way of ownership as the partial payment for your tenant improvements? He said, I got 30%. And I said, Jack, 
just for everybody's edification. Am I correct or incorrect, since I saw it on the tax return, that the shares to the ownership of the partial ownership of the restaurant are in the name of the single asset LLC, which now has another asset in it? He said, yes, it is. I said, Jack, Adrian's not putting up a quarter million dollars cash. I recommend, and your lawyers and your accountants are going to have to work this out, and we will agree to it, that we'll dividend out to you the shares of the restaurant ownership, which is generating over the next seven years over a half million dollars. I think that's a boatload of more collateral than you need from Adrian. Now, there may be some tax consequences that I'm not going to deal with for dividending out, but that's on your watch before Adrian takes over the corporation. Wow. Well, so in, in the, the entity that owned the building, mm-hmm. the entity also had 30% shares of the restaurant that was a that's tenant. Right, which was a tenant in the building. And annually, that that was producing eighty north of eighty thousand dollars of of income. Uh, yes. To, the, to, to 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 Jack as a partial owner, it's an awesome restaurant, making a boatload of money. Restaurants don't always do that. Right. But this one was. So had this not so, and let me just make sure I understand the the end of this. So then at the at the close, then did did uh, uh, buyers did the close. The ownership of the shares of the stock were dividended out to Jack as a dividend with tax consequences for receiving a dividend for an asset. But to receive clear with no liability against it, the 80 plus thousand dollars of income and the ownership was going to go and he still owns, he still owns a piece of the restaurant and The loan was only going to be for another nine years, and right. it's now coming up on, like, year eight. He still owns a piece of the restaurant. It's coming in, and it's a win-win for him because sometimes you need to do everything necessary on a pre-due diligence basis, which is what we did, to gather information. It's not just about the logical things. How many square foot, who's here, review the leases, get the lease summaries, and verify the asset and do the inspections and all that kind of good stuff. You need to understand the full scope of what is going on with the asset and how it's done and what's going on with it. And by doing that, up front, we were able to determine a structure that greatly reduced his outgo, reduced his purchase price from $3 million to $2.5 million, reduced his outgo for down payment from $1.2 million to $250,000 plus the twenty five dollars in closing costs. And he picked up an existing loan, which was in place for nine more years. It had a 25-year AM and a nine-year term left on it. Wow. So this is the way you got, you got something, not just for verifying the asset and doing your due diligence. It provided the evidence material, the truth, and the proof to provide the appropriate and more beneficial structure outside of the box. I don't believe in the box. So working around it with no box is easy for me. But I think everybody's can't be trapped in their egocentric predicament of, well, we have to do it this way or that way. Right. Just because right. he wanted cash to the loan doesn't mean you're going to give it to him that way. And we didn't. And I knew his interest was in getting this off of his plate. So he could go to another project and build something which I think is probably making twice as much NOI. Right. So oh. if you have an agenda, you need to recognize this. Listening to all the information and putting it together, so you structure a transaction up front that is a win-win deal, but not just a win-win deal, but a deal that meets and completes all of the underlying issues 
that are the reason the person's selling the place in the, in the building in the first place. Why would you sell a building with that kind of awesome cash flow? Right. There has to be something going on. Common sense says there's a why. Right. The uh, agent didn't know what the why was. But on our four-hour tour of the building, I heard the why. He talked about the set of projects he's got going on and so forth. And the same lender that gave him the $2 million loan for the existing building was offering him a $7 million loan for the next one. Right. But they wanted this off of his plate as well. Because you can't have a focus on two different projects and be myopically focused on the new one where your time, effort, energy, and all your interests have to be there. And that's a broader scope of due diligence because we used it up front to structure the deal. We used the evidence we gained from doing the due diligence to structure a restructure of a possible outgo of a quarter million dollars to guarantee the loan. Right. It wasn't, I mean, the triple net was there. Right. But I went to the back pages of the silly tax return and saw extraordinary items. There was no reason to look for it, but I did. So right. if you look for things that are anomalies or outside of the norm, you have to come up with a, aha, huh, that's interesting. I didn't point it out to him at the time. It wasn't relevant. And even when we got off the phone, he was so on, he said, Doc, I'm the guy who's a CPA, certified internal auditor, certified management accountant with a master's degree in accounting. How in the heck did you have all those numbers you're driving in the car? I said, because I read the note. The note said there was no due on sale clause. I guarantee you the institution is never, ever, ever going to do it again. I've been told they changed it, so they put a due on sale. If any more than 10% of the ownership changes in the corporation, the note's called. Well, 100% went away, and they couldn't call it. I like that. Yeah. Well, I, the, the whole thing, uh, I mean, I, I get the, you know, the structure and how you were able to uh, do it. I guess one of the things I'm thinking of is if, if this hadn't been um, – called into question and, and Adrian actually had the, the opportunity had he, had he uh, made uh, uh, or was able to come up with the, the down payment, he could have ended up with the additional cash flow from the restaurant. Could he not? Yes, he would have. And yes, he uh, so he actually did them a favor uh, in like you were able to eloquently put it there on your, on the highway drive uh, in Idaho uh, that he was uh, he wa- he wanted the three hundred eleven thousand dollars, right? That's what he wanted. He didn't, and he didn't even know about the other because I didn't yeah. share with him until I had to, right? Uh, so and, and, he got what he wanted, and to be fair and and to do this the right way, I don't believe in taking advantage of other people. Yes, he could have picked up eighty three thousand dollars. But it would have been at the cost of uh, him having to put up a quarter million dollars. Right. And I waited whether I was going to give Adrian the chance to do it one way or the other. And I said, Adrian, is it true you really just want the $311,000 triple net income? He said, that's what I'm buying, Doc. Now, I didn't allude to the other part. Now, if he'd have put up the quarter million dollars, he would have had the shares also for the extra $84,000. Jack would have been a very upset camper. I'm not sure it would have closed. I think he would have balked at the last minute. Right. Because he now would have realized that he lost, a, I mean, he was picking up four hundred grand, almost. Right. So yeah. I think the, the deal would have been in jeopardy, and frankly, it was just not right to, I won't say cheat him out of it, but to finesse taking from him an asset that he forgot was in the corporation. Because right. it's not the normal way to doing things. You don't want to just sell the, corp- the asset in the corporation. And he wasn't thinking outside the box either. He was just right. saying, yeah, well, it's, he labeled it as a single asset LLC. Right. So he wasn't thinking about the fact there was a, an 
and it's the liar, it's the only only asset, but is it? Is are the shares in the corporation of the restaurant another asset? I think so. But it's not another real estate asset, or is it? Because ownership in a restaurant is not really real estate, it's ownership of a business. Right. So it was just it was a judgment call I had to make and rather than make it convoluted and one sided, I decided to play the cards I had. No, I, I and, think Adrian, and I asked Adrian the, the question you're putting forward. How would you have felt if you had to put the quarter million dollars and you inherited the restaurant? He said, I wouldn't want the liability of a restaurant. Right. So well, and I it, made and, the right call. Yeah, I know. Yeah, and, and clearly you did. I mean, everybody got what they wanted. And and uh, I think your, you know, your initial tour of the property, you were able to unclose uh, what the seller... A lot seller, more than just physical yeah. stuff. Right. The story. The story yeah. of, of why Perhaps this was a good why? Why would you have a building when would it, would it, you know it's kinda of like the old expression, if it sounds too good to be true, it can't be true. Right. So why would someone sell at over a ten cap for a guy who's a bright guy, why isn't he selling this for a seven cap? Right. Why is he doing it? Because he wants it done, gone now. There has to be a big why. And I need to get to it. And we did. Right. So that's part of, I think, the investor's job is to find out what's going on in the big picture, not just a checklist will not give you that answer. I have checklists of what you need to do for your due diligence. But understanding the overarching issues underlining the sale itself are important as well. Right. And his his need was not necessarily to get cash, but to get that off his balance sheet, right? That's correct. The, that's, the why, that's why he acquiesced, because he already had the, line, line, the building under contract he was going to buy. He already put the down payment down. He didn't need any money for that. And he had all the money he needed from the construction loan he had pending. So picking up a quarter million dollars was just frosting on the cake. He really wanted to sell it just as a straight deal, but he didn't have to. There's a difference between have to and want to. And I understood he was well enough because I asked him. I said, "So you've already made the, you've already got your down payment in escrow to buy the new building?" He said, "I do, all of it." And I didn't ask him all of it. He told me all of it. And so you have all the money you need to do this project with that and a loan. He said, "I do." Well, that told me point blank he didn't have to have the one point two million dollars. Right. Right. You know, you're at, and I'm not asking that question directly. I got the answer to produce the result. I knew what his agenda was because what is someone's long-term plan? Or they just want to retire and they want all the money back. Or they've got something else they've got to take care of. Or they've got taxes they've got to pay or whatever it is. Right. But get you need to, it. to know in your due diligence more than just physical stuff, checklist of leases and summaries and, and the building C of O and all the rest of that stuff that we all know about. Right. You have to, in my opinion, for the best interest of you and really your seller, understand the scope and magnitude of what they're trying to accomplish, why and how, and then match up, match up your response to something that accomplishes their objective, maybe in a way that they didn't even think of. Jack told me later on, I never thought of selling the corporation. I said, well, it worked out well for everybody. He said, well, I would figure I'd have to do a liquidation and all that got a good step for I sold the asset and, and complicate the whole things and all the rest of that, and I didn't have to do that. And I said, uh-huh. And I got the shares of the restaurant. I said, uh-huh. He said, thanks. I appreciate yeah. you being honest because that could have legitimately gone to Adrian. And I said, frankly, Adrian didn't want the restaurant. He thought he had a good deal. I think he got a good deal. I mean, you make more than 100%, 300%, 
three hundred eleven thousand over two fifty. Even if it's through the two seventy five, including closing costs, you're, you're still doing uh, well. Cash on cash at a push in thirteen percent cap rate. Thirteen cap rate? That's crazy. That's, yeah, exactly. No one in their right mind sells stuff at a thirteen cap rate. But you know what? He did because he, he had a need. Mm-hmm. Not just a want. Hey, Doc. So. I want to uh, go back to the fact that the uh, the ownership structure of the the uh, the building was in a corp. Did that play into this at all? Was it was it an S corp or was it a C corp? It was a uh, C corp. So did that make it any more difficult for him if he were to uh, to have sold uh, the asset? In essence, no. no. You could have had that in an LLC or in a corporation. They're very similar to the ultimate tax consequences for for you based on your your basis in the corporation and selling those things. It's there's some more paperwork that has to be done from a tax return standpoint, but instead of just a straight sale of an asset. But the man had a good account. He had good lawyers, and I put it out there in front of all of them on the phone. I said, look, there will be tax consequences for taking the dividend. You already know that you've already determined the consequences, uh, to the extent there are, for selling the corporation. So the only issue is what's the additional potential tax consequences for the incident of the sale of the underlying asset within the corporation. Got it. That's Uh, just a dividend. Right. In lots of jurisdictions, the dividend is taxed at a lower rate than ordinary income. Right. Huh? Interesting. Interesting. Sneaky. I'm sorry, not sneaky. Crafty. No, well, I, I, I hats off to you, uh, for being aware, I wanted to ask you, um, you know, in a normal transaction, um, you know, all the documents we've talked about, I'm familiar with uh, being provided. I mean, obviously the leases, uh, repair records, um, you know, in any kind of, um, I, is a loan document or is that usually pretty, pretty easy for, uh, and also you mentioned the tax returns. I, I'm, I'm certain of the, the tax records for uh, rent records and that kind of stuff, but uh, was, was that just a, a normal due diligence that you were getting all that information and reviewing that? I, I, I asked for the tax returns. You don't, I mean, let's be, you have an, you have an audience here and they understand this business. Mm-hmm. If I'm dealing with a local real estate agent or with a seller, I do not ask up front for everything. If I want to get a no, do a frontal assault. Say, give me the tax returns and all this kind of good stuff. No, I don't do that. I ask simply for the last three years, income and expenses, and a current rent roll, which will probably result not in an audited number, but with a summary number of income and expenses. And 12 units at uh, the apartment building, each paying $600 a month. Right. Well, that gives me a basic information. I'm going to drill down and ask for additional information, including but not limited to, in a scale of things, probably after we make the offer and we signed an appropriate confidentiality agreement, which I would want to have signed if I were doing it, I give it to them. We will give you a confidentiality agreement, but we need to see the tax returns. Now, if it's a personal deal, we don't need to see your your 1040. What we want to see is a Schedule E. Right. Or in Revenue Canada, it's a, it's a, uh, uh, it's a separate form, and uh, you get that whole tax return. So in the U.S., you would get the corporate return. In this case, it was a corporate tax return. Well, you get a corporate tax return, and you review it because – I want to understand what's going on with this thing because many times there are things you're going to discover. Think about this. If you've gotten all the breakdown of all the repairs, right. and they seem relatively low, 
and yet the place looks in good shape. Yeah, where was... What where happened? Was, yeah, I'll tell you what I, happened. They capitalized it. They didn't expense it. Right. And the only place you're going to know that is on the tax return when they change the capital tax basis of the asset. Right. I mean, th- I mean, I'm not trying to make this complicated, but you asked the question. I want to tell you why I asked for it. Because right. that also gives me, you know, if someone gives you the return and it's not audited, how do you know that it's accurate? Well, if they swore to repent or perjury to the U.S. federal government or Revenue Canada, this is a true and accurate information under penalty of perjury. It is highly probable it is maybe even more precise than other numbers you may have. It also may have what I call the highest believable number on expenses. Right. Okay. And when they're presenting to you, they're going to put the minimal expenses. So, and sometimes there's a justification to say, look, you've explained to the IRS that you have all these expenses, and yet you're telling me there's like half these expenses. Can you explain to me what's going on here? I've already right. signed a confidentiality agreement, so this is a confidential discussion. Right. That way I can hold them accountable, and they don't have to risk uh, revealing something that they might not tell you. Right. Because you've already signed a confidentiality agreement. Hey, on and the, then, um, all of a sudden, you got the real numbers. Right. No, I like yep. that. That makes makes complete sense. Because especially a lot of times, if you're dealing with some sort of a mom and pop kind of a oh, yeah. uh, operation, you're not, you're, they go, the they go, you're they get go to Walmart and Costco and they buy all this stuff for the house. Yep. They, you know, the world's worst one from my perspective, when it comes to commercial, it's a mobile home park. Oh, yeah? Mobile home park, if it's not a senior one, 60, 70, 80% of all the money coming in on a mobile home park, you'll find out the due diligence, never hit the bank account. It was made out for cash, in cash, or a money order with nobody's name on it from a 7-Eleven or a Circle K. Because they don't even have a bank account. Right. And somehow the manager doesn't make to make that to the balance sheet. So how the heck do you really know what the income is? Because you do not have, in many cases, an accurate number. Right. Hmm. Uh-huh. Oh, so, I mean, yeah. that, that makes it difficult when you're trying to sell something like that. Right. Because how do you provide the proof? Yep. Well... Oh, yeah. We we just sort of didn't put it all in the bank, and, you know, no one's really looking, and it's okay. But trust me. Yeah. You're asking me to trust you. You lied to the federal government, who has some real teeth, yeah. committed tax fraud, hid the money, but I believe you. Right. I, so, I mean, I'm, just, I'm, I'm going to the far extreme on an example, okay? Yes, hey, let me ask you on, on the, uh, the bank loan, because... Yeah. Um, is that uh, a fairly common thing? I know. Uh, I'm trying to think if I've seen a a bank loan. I, I've. I've uh, I mean, most. I guess unless it was advertised that it was assumable. Uh, is that something that was that in your conversation that you learned that it was assumable? It wasn't uh, due on sale, or what was? Is that well, a, in reviewing the document, the loan never. The loan never changed. Right. The corporation had a loan. The lender was the lender. The corporation was the borrower. None of that changed. Right. So it didn't really get assumed. Think right. about that. Right, right, right. There was All no. All did is change the ownership. Right. And by changing the ownership, some loan documents, when well, I have to tell you that institution has now put in a document, which is an additional page saying if there's any material change in the ownership of the corporation, and many times it's like 20% or 10%, whatever it is. If there's more than a 10% change in ownership or 20% change of ownership, they have the right to call the loan because the entity has materially changed. Right. 
I didn't say adversely changed. I just said materially changed. Materially, right. More than, it, would that be? And, uh, and it's material is it's their call. Right. I've never seen 5%, but I've seen 10, 20, 30, and 40. Right. Right. L let me ask you, um, this is clearly an example of a, uh, of, um, you know, some good de detective work on your part to uh, help your, uh, your mentee get the deal there. How often do you find things like this in your uh, due diligence efforts? You're, I think you'll find elements of this um, in probably a third of the deals you're going to go out there and look at. Some of them are vanilla flavored and it's all straightforward. Many times you're going to find items where they've um, loaded up all the repairs and they put it to the capital basis of the property to lower the expenses instead of 20, 30, 40 percent, it's down at 10, which is a red flag, obviously. Um, and you don't know that until you've done your due diligence to find out what's going on. So you also have issues where they made these certain improvements and uh, uh, they play games with uh, the, rev the revenue, to, uh, revenue uh, code 179 where they basically depreciated, but they didn't appreciate. They just flat out expensed certain assets that they, that they bought. Now, when it comes to tenant improvements, in a, in a particularly in places like an apartment building, we all know you could do cost segregation. Right. And that's a whole different topic. But the bottom line is that there are things like that which compl complicate the issues. While your tax return will reflect that you have no income, you really do have the income. You've just sheltered it by taking a 39-year or 27-and-a-half-year depreciation schedule on a, some portion of the assets, the tenant improvements, the refrigerators, the microwaves, the dishwashers, and read them off in five to seven years. Right. Do we say that's going to reduce your current taxes? Oh, yeah. Some jurisdictions, like in Houston for a while there, after Katrina and so forth, they had a double depreciation they allowed on the state return. So wow. all of those things are going to be out there. You need to find out what happened. Don't be one of those people who says, well, I know something happened, but I don't know what happened. You better I, find out. I, I, uh, to do diligence. Because what I read about it is I say entire, full due diligence. That's a broader scope than just due diligence. It's everything you need to make what I call the intelligent, informed business decision to acquire or not acquire a commercial piece of real estate. I like it. No, that's, uh, that is a, uh, a better way than, than uh, shooting in the dark. I mean... Uh, <laughs> It sure is. It sure is. Well, yeah. I mean, some people say, is it really necessary to do all that? In my opinion, yes. Now, could you take it a shortcut? Could you not have found out such stuff? Could you have been where he would have been if he hadn't done what he did? He would never have bought that building. He didn't have $1.2 million. Right. And he might still be trying to sell it for three million bucks. Somebody would have come along, bought it at ten cap, and done that deal. But it wasn't even listed for sale. Right. No, no. Right. Right. <laughs> so, I mean, yeah. is everything. No, I like it. I like it. Well, uh, Doc, I, I'm uh, I'm looking at this, and I'm. I'm wondering, is there one thing that you could point to for the audience uh, for them to, to think about in, uh, in a deal as far as due diligence? I think the overarching question becomes, why are they selling? What personal or business reason is causing them to sell what you perceive to be a wonderful property? Unless you're buying a piece of junk that you're going to re rehab or reposition. But if you've got a cash-flowing piece of property, why is someone dumping it or selling it? Also, if you've got a cap rate which is a little higher than normal, 
have to go, hmm, there's a reason. I would perceive, logically, that there's a level of motivation that's undisclosed that they need to accomplish or something. I don't know what it is. But evoking from them in a dialogue, and fortunately the real estate agent who, lawyer who is my friend knows me, and we've done a number of deals, he said, Doc, I'm just going along for the ride. <laughs> <laughs> You talk to Jack, and you work out this deal. But by the end of the day, you're going to know him better than all of us. That's great. Well, uh, I think when you find out the why, you're going to you're going to you're going to have things that you'll be able to look for, and that'll give you a hint. That makes complete sense. Uh, words words of wisdom and words to uh, live by when you're you're out there uh, hunting for a deal is uh, find out the why. I like it. Uh, if you find out the why, then the what behind it will be revealed. Maybe with some questions, and maybe it may be the paperwork you already have, if you're looking for it and the details. Right. Okay. I got it. All I right. It. Hey, Doc, I uh, appreciate you taking the time to do this today. Um, before we uh, wrap this up, What's the best way for our uh, listeners to um, uh, get in touch with you? Well, uh, the best way is probably go to my website, commercialrealestatementor.org. All right. And uh, there's a whole lot of information on there. And uh, as I shared with you, one of the things I'm going to do is uh, we have uh, the – White paper I have on how to escape the residential rut, which I'll make available for you. I have it uh, right now being finished off. It's already written and polished. I'll have it for you next week, and I'll send it to you to okay. share with your audience. Oh, now, great. if anyone is interested in proceeding forward to try and understand how they can get like 77 videos, online resources where I answer all the questions and downloads and software and everything else for your audience. I'm going to make a, a, a an offer. And that would be, I know I sell my course. It's for sale right now on the website for $2,000. But for your people, and I haven't released this yet because I'm just about to launch it, and I told you that earlier today. Right. Because this is for your people who understand this business, I will give them a 50% off coupon, and there are two ways they can pay for it. One is to pay up front, and that would be, you know, less than $1,000. The coupon code is C-R-E-P-N. All right. All right. And if they want to take advantage of a six pay, which is less than $200 a month, they can certainly do that. And that code would be, for that opportunity, is C-R-E-P-N, the number six. So your people could get it for half price and do a one pay or a six pay. And what I have in there is, in the course, I have a question box which I go in personally and answer several times a, uh, a week. So you're not alone just getting a book or a course. You're getting access to me through that modality. And uh, by the time we have this outrage to release, I'm going to have some other bonuses I'm going to throw in there as well, and uh, they'll be able to see them online. Oh, that's great, and uh, very generous, and thank you for offering that. I'll, that uh, I'm sure that'll be well received, and and uh, a lot of people will be uh, maybe the next example of your uh, uh, golden. Love to have uh, them as a mentee and help yeah. them go from where they are to where they need to be, and no, and, and 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 view and then give them. I mean, I've had people with experience. But I have 40 years' experience doing every kind of a transaction you can imagine. I'd love to help them go from where they are to where they need to be. Because I'm also going to throw in for them a phone coaching call. 
as part of one of the bonuses, and that'll all be spelled out. Okay? So they can actually get a deal analysis for me. That's so great. That's kind of a spectacular offer when you put it all together. So, Darren, it's wonderful to talk to you again, and uh, I'm looking forward to uh, um, hearing from your mentees, your uh, viewers as a potential mentee. Have a wonderful day, and take care. All right, Doc. Thanks again. You're welcome. Bye-bye. Well, there's your proof. It pays to review all of the information you get during due diligence. I think... uh, Most of us are trained to look for the obvious, Captain Obvious, as they say. But as it was uh, clearly pointed out, and it's often said, the devil is in the details. And uh, if you do your work, you might just end up with something that you can use uh, to your advantage and end up with a uh, property like Doc Student did there, one that was over a 12 cap and provided uh, over 100% annual cash-on-cash returns. Pretty amazing. Be sure to check out the show notes and click on the link to get Doc's white paper, How to Escape the Residential Rut. And also, if you're interested in being mentored by Doc, don't forget to check out the links there for the 50% off his his coursework there. If you like this interview or conversation with Doc, the best way to let us know is to go to iTunes and give us a five-star review. And uh, be sure to subscribe. That way you can listen anytime and anywhere. Also, don't forget, if you're on social media, go ahead and look me up. Uh, I'm under J. Darren Gross. It's just the letter J, no punctuation, uh, Darren, D-A-R-R-I-N, Gross, G-R-O-S-S. And if you're on LinkedIn, be sure to check out our group, Commercial Real Estate Pro Network. It's a, a great place to network with commercial real estate professionals. That's all I've got this week. Until next time, thanks for listening to Commercial Real Estate Pro Network's CREPN Radio. You're listening to CREPN Radio for influential commercial real estate professionals. For more information on this or any of our guests, like us on Facebook, CREPN Radio.